AUKUS is going to boil down to one thing, and that is American and British nuclear subs and nuclear armed being based in Australian ports. So what would you ideally want the relationship to be then? Give yeah, me a snapshot where, of that. Where, one where America respects us more because they never know when we're going to say, well, listen, we're not going that far. I said, you're telling me with this signature we declare a hundred new national parks in this region of the state. He said, yep. I said, well, I think I'll do it. I don't even know if I need an introduction. We probably do because of an international audience, but this is one of the most successful premiers in Australian history, the right, the Honourable Bob Carr, who also was a federal foreign minister for a while. And uh, I'm absolutely stoked to have him on the channel. Thank you so much for your time, well, sir. I'm stoked to be on the channel. Uh, it's famous and I love it. Good. Are you going to show us, like, your life? Is that your plan today? Yeah, well, it's a pretty ordinary life. It's, uh, <laughs> this, this was Matraville, where I grew up. It's Sydney suburbia on the coast. This was a great place for a kid to grow up. It seems today. It was unbelievably good to grow up yeah. there. There was, there was a lot of bushland. There were yep. old uh, fortifications out on the Malabar headland. There were the beaches, the garbage tips, which were wonderful, and just a lot of open space and hills for billy carts. It's actually quite an idyllic Australian upbringing. Like, if I thought about what, uh, you know, 50s Australia was like, it seems like Bob Carr experienced, like, bang right in the median of that. Yeah. Yes. OK. Yeah. This was my high school, Matraville High School. I've, I'm very indebted. It was a very ordinary education. And because it was a new school, it didn't have cadets. I would have liked to have learnt to fire a rifle. Um, <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah, it did leave me hungry. I wasn't spoon fed. It left me hungry, as I am to this day, to complete and expand the education. It started for me. Yes, because if there's one thing that I think everybody says about Bob Carr, uh, even your critics, I'll see this, this is like Bob Carr is not an idiot. You know, like he is well read, he knows what he's talking about. And so you think that this kind of that, that kind of hunger for it was here because there was kind of like it gave you like a little bit of a feed for it, but not enough to kind of say yeah, 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 very much so. Uh, I remember a wonderful English teacher saying, "You've got to keep reading, even if it's the the book reviews of the Sydney Morning Herald on a on a Saturday." or the Reader's Digest, you've, you've got to keep reading. Okay, so that started the lifelong habit, just that. Except, of course, the sports pages, it seems. You're never yeah, a fan of yeah, that. I, I, uh, <laughs> Bob Ellis said to me once, I, uh, the late Bob Ellis, one of my speechwriters and a good friend, he said, Bob, you were born without a sporting gene. Yeah. And it is, it's a, it's a disability. <laughs> I can't relate to anything In that Australia? Happens. It is. Absolutely. It's an absolute disability, and there's nothing and a guy I've been that able oversaw to do the Olympics. Yep. <laughs> I uh, well, I had Kissinger there to spend time with during the Olympics. The former U.S. Secretary <laughs> of State. I, to distract you from the drabbery. Yep. It must have been so hard trying to run for governorship in this country and just being like, I kind of know the difference between NRL and AFL, like that level. Yeah. And yet every. Every sporting hero I met was very impressive. I thought they were lovely people <laughs> for the most part. And it was a pleasure to meet them, but they were politely astonished that I couldn't recall their names or <laughs> what they'd done or whether it had been tennis or golf. Yeah. You know, while you're talking about this as well, it just kept flashing in my mind all of these teachers that I, I just have little snippets because I was too young to be kind of like engaged. Well, you're proving this wrong in an F stop, but mm. I wasn't that engaged <clears throat> in politics at that age. But they were always talking about your reforms in schools being crucial and really, really changing their lives as teachers. Yeah, I was, de I was determined that we have the best curriculum in Australia. So I also made it possible to study English and history, modern and ancient, at four unit level as you could study sciences. Mm. And what we found is that when we gave the option to kids of doing it at a harder level in the last two years, even up to university standard, there were youngsters who said, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. And I thought of the years when I'd been under-challenged, under-challenged mm. by what I was getting at this, mm -hmm. at this school. Mm -hmm. um, and thought we had rectified that. I'm very proud when I hear principals say, well, look, New South Wales and everything, sciences, humanities, the arts, ended up with the best curriculum in Australia. You've got to be happy with that. Yeah, I'm very happy. No, I, I, think, I think there are some things governments do that, that reach out to the future. And saving the environment yeah. is one of them. 
if you'd You've clear, got an amazing record on that. Yeah, 350 new national parks. Yeah. And I was reading this. Just so everyone knows, that's 1.2 <coughs> million hectares of land that you set aside. Yeah, at least that, I think. At least that. I remember, I mean, one of the nicest days, sweetest days as Premier, I said to my staff who had the papers in front of me just after I, I got re-elected in the 99 election, I said, OK, South Coast, we're looking at the area between the Bega Valley and Jarvis Bay, I think. I said, you're telling me with this signature we declare 100 new national parks in this region of the state. He said, yep. I said, well, I think I'll do it. Yes. And with one signature, there were a hundred new national parks gifted the future generations. Unbelievable. And I had to get up from a, a desk and, and walk around my office to steady myself after making that decision. I was just, I, if all my time in politics, all my time as opposition leader had been to get to that point, yeah? it was worthwhile. So after that, it was kind of just like, ah, well, yeah, I'll just ride this out as long as I can. But <laughs> no, no, it was nothing like that. <laughs> nothing like that. Now we're at Malabar Public School, and this is uh, very special for you, isn't it? This is real formation years things, but not for the school part. No, I, at the age of 15, I got the idea into my head I should become a politician. What, what happened there? What? It, it, it is weird. <laughs> yeah. It is weird. I just, I just had heard my father talk about politics, and I'd wanted to be a newspaper cartoonist up till then. Um, but I thought, no, um, a politician. I like to speak. Um, he got me interested in what the Labor Party is. And I thought the thing to do is to join the political party. And I worked out that the local branch of the Labor Party met in the school on the second Monday of every, every month. So as a kid in short pants, I, I came down and introduced myself. And they said, oh, we, we think you're probably too young. I said, oh, I've checked the rules. You can join when you're 15. No. Really? Hang on. So you were schooling them on Labor Party policy immediately. I'm you, sure you were very popular. Um, well, <laughs> a, a, a kid, <laughs> a kid being a recruit, this was something new. Yeah. I remember the local federal member, Danny Curtin, saying to me, he's a former iron worker, he said to me, uh, you're not after my seat, are you, young Robbie? And I thought, well, I am really. I'm, I'm here to succeed you. <laughs> but it, it's a story I like telling because I want to give youngsters the challenge of thinking about whether they can make a contribution by joining the political party of their choice. See, now, this is something that we're hammering on about all the time. <coughs> uh, in these branches lies a lot of power. A lot of power. A, a lot, lot of power. Of power. Yeah, yeah. Some 15 year old rocking up here at some school yeah. gets to shape how the state is getting formed yeah, in like a yeah. pretty profound way, really. Yeah. If you're in a, in a local branch of your party, the Liberal Party, the Labor Party, and you express a view, you've got 1,000 times the influence if you weren't in the party, if you're just an ordinary citizen writing a letter to your Yeah, MP. news .com comments. Yeah. Plus, like, I don't know, it seems like it'd probably be a pretty nice day. It's probably some lamingtons there. Yeah. They seem bad. Yeah, and, and on polling day, my first election, 1963, the federal ele election, the father who'd been watching the results come in on TV said, it's all over. It's all over. Labor's lost. You're going to have to get rid of Caldwell, who was in the party leader, throw out the left wing, um, make Whitlam the leader. And I was just so appalled. I was shattered by that defeat. I think it produced this, this total dedication to the idea that my, my side of politics should, be, should aspire to be the most professional. We shouldn't subject ourselves to defeats. That's interesting. This idea of like the natural party of government, where it kind of exactly. feels like they should yeah. be the ones in power. Yeah. And so you were kind of like part of this new wave that was pushing. Yeah, I, I was a teenage Whitlamite. From Whitlam, I yeah. think I imbibed the sense that you should you should aim to have the better performance in the parliament. Uh huh. That if you dominate in the parliament you'll end up inspiring your supporters outside the parliament. You, you should be honouring your audience by giving them a good show. And that means serious policy ideas and lively rhetoric and the use of humour, the use of humour, which I think is too easily overlooked. 
I'm not good at making up jokes, but I would, as opposition leader, I'd get a team in my office and I'd say, well, I'm thinking of moving no confidence in the grind emotion on the way they've wasted this money here or there. Um, what are some jokes we can tell? And that's how you get your best lines. Yes. We call it, we call it the one liners group. Oh, amazing. So you actually had a writer's room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other reasons that you stuck with Labor other than your uncle said that it's a good party? I thought it captured best the idea of a big, interesting, modern Australia. Mm, mm, mm. Want to have a look at Malabar Beach? Yes. Choked with sewage when I was a kid? Yes, I do. Nice to be here. Do you live in Malabar? Yes, we do. Hi. How are you? You're still looking fabulous. No. You, you guys look fabulous. Taking these monsters. <laughs> well, taking these monsters. Because we're in Malabar. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this, this is now beautiful. But when we were kids, it was quite dangerous to swim here. Did you do it anyway? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is fond childhood memories for you. This is playtime, yeah? Your yeah, adventures yeah. of this, Tom this, Sawyer. To, to, this have, is... to, have this, to have this in your backyard was terrific. We overlooked the fact that it was significantly polluted by the sewage uh, outfall on the headlands. And it was the submarine ocean outfalls that took the sewage right out to sea that made it swimmable, swimmable again. And uh, my government put money into stormwater control so that even after heavy downpour, you did not encounter uh, pollution from the road surfaces. Um, and I mean, it just, it just makes the case that action through politics improves the lives of people. That's I think I... we can all attest to that. It's nice seeing glassy water as opposed to yeah, brown yeah, water. Yeah, and, and uh, swimming in it probably feels a little bit better, I'd imagine. I would think so. Yeah. The thing <laughs> that I was reading about you is you were constantly ruffling feathers uh, federally as well. Uh, you took like a hardline stance of like trying to cap immigration. That must have been very unpopular back in the day. Yeah, I had the support though, even of, of ethnic leaders, leaders of, of uh, not only speaking background, recent migrants, yes. who understood what I was saying. And that is that, hey, the, the ecology of this continent is very special. Mm. You've got a narrow, fertile coastal strip. Mm. And if you have these mad dreams of a population of 100 million, <laughs> then that's what you're getting. I mean, all the coastal strip ends up looking, looking like the Gold Coast. Now, there's a place for Nothing the Gold wrong Coast. With that, yeah. And the concentration of that development there saves a lot of other places. But if you, if you, you want an Australia with 100 million, mm. then you're going to lose the You say goodbye to lot. these things, yeah, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The sense of, of space and easy contact with nature is what makes Australia special. Mm. It's really strange, actually, Bob. Like, you really don't think very conventionally for a politician. You bring your own little weird ideas and crusades to the Premier's yeah, cabinet. Yeah. Well, I think that that's kind of what's happened now. I'm not sure, but it really seems like that there is a big anti-immigration sentiment, and not in the Pauline Hanson way, but in the, like, can we just have yeah, a breather here, yes, here yeah, you know? Right. Yeah, can we and just you were have kind a breather, of at the forefront let, of that. Let the infrastructure catch up. Uh, we don't have to end up looking like Hong Kong or, or Singapore with no alternative to high density living. And some other feathers that you've been ruffling recently uh, is about AUKUS. Yeah, look, I, I think in every respect there's been a retreat from Australian sovereignty. We've given the impression that if there's a war between China and the US, we would be in it on day one. And I want to revert to the old Australian approach on Taiwan under coalition governments and Labor governments. Well, hang on. The ANZUS Treaty does not oblige us to enter such a war. Mm. And I just, I've got this sense that we've got a, about the level of independence now of American territories, Puerto Rico or Guam. Hey, that kind of feels like us, doesn't it? Guam it does. of the Southern why Hemisphere. Wouldn't there, why wouldn't there be an instinct for independence? AUKUS is going to boil down to one thing. And that is American and British nuclear subs and nuclear armed being based in Australian ports. So I'm totally at odds with what the Albanese government is doing. Mm. And I don't like the way their rhetoric has suggested that if America goes to war with China, we're going to be in it because the gap mm. has been narrowing. Mm -hmm. the, the, the other thing that I, was, uh, that I really liked about you making this point 
which is, we get it, right? Like, America is the emperor. You know, it's kind of like a governorship province. But, you know, governors can still argue with the emperor about things. They get that they call the shots at yeah, the end of yeah, the day, yeah, yeah. you know, but at least have the argument. And we it seems like you were saying, yes, we got out of, got out of the habit, habit of, the, of it. Having a good argument with a, an ally. Any, any chance of getting these showers fixed quicker? Because I'm out of it now, but I can pass that on to yeah, it, it's the like council. That. It's been like that for a month. I'll ring the mayor. At least a month. I'll ring the mayor. The mayor, thank you. Damn, public service never ends. <laughs> no, but it's an honour. You're going to be in your, like an iron lung in your closing <laughs> days, and people will be sitting there being like, the hospital lights are out, do no, something no, I think, about I it. I think well. beyond that, I'll be <laughs> being lowered into the uh, <laughs> crematorium oven, and they'll be saying, Bob, you see the price of fuel these days? Yeah. <laughs> How are you? I mean, I'm just... What about you and I at school? You're kidding? No, not at all. How are you? Yeah, Great what, what's you your name? Huh? Alan Glass. You're Alan? Yeah. Good on you, Alan. Alan. I, with place. that off, I would have recognised you. Going, I, told <laughs> you I, wanted to, I told you I wanted to be a newspaper cartoonist when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah and yeah, Alan... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alan was more gifted than I. Oh, I <laughs> See, I told you I don't tell lies. I do know Bob. No, no, no. You're all the best, Bob. This has been very funny, this little journey. Hasn't it? Tell you what, that must be a rare treat that you have that not many other politicians would have, I imagine. Being in public service your entire life and walking down the street and not getting spat on. <coughs> you know? yeah, I, I think Scott Morrison would face a challenge, wouldn't he? Are you liked? I don't know, like, do, do people well, come up well, to you over no, the time no, and they're I, just I like, you got to, you're a scam you know, people? No, you've got to expect that in, in a, a democratic society, people have got different views, but I think, I think you can say, in, in Australia, there's, there's a bit of respectful give and take. Well, that's great, because I thought that you and Kevin Rudd were, like, really rare exceptions when I was walking around. It seems like there's just, like, a really warm public goodwill towards you guys. No, I think it'd be more broadly extended and... Okay. Um, Perhaps it's easier for a premier, for a state leader, if one has been there for a decade. Yeah, I think that's it. If you, you like, like John Howard or me, uh, you've been there for a stretch, and you uh, you become associated with the with the times. Yeah, yeah. While you were premier, how often did you get the newspaper headline <coughs> car crash? How how often? Was there some kind of more, more, when I, more, when, more when I was in opposition? Um, really? I remember, I remember once when I was in government and they'd been my first term. There was a, a bit of a kerfuffle in the the welfare portfolio, and there was a, a strike somewhere else. And the Herald came out with the front page: cars chaos. <laughs> and there were two entirely unrelated events. So you got into the habit when you were Premier, your way of dealing with the media was to just go <coughs> on to the AM talk shows, stare the belly of the beast right in its, in its eyes, yeah. and you just have the argument every day. I regarded um, morning radio as being, and, 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 and drive time radio as being a precious opportunity to have a, a backwards and forwards communication with your electorate, talking to Alan Jones. Alan, Alan, you're striking a note of anger here about what's happened to this school building, and I'll take it seriously and I'll have it investigated, but I just want to remind you and your listeners that last week we got the interstate comparisons and we've got the best literacy and the best numeracy results of any school system in Australia. That's not what the question is, Mr Premier, I ask him. But, but I think you've got to seize the opportunity <laughs> to get over a positive message yeah even when you're you're, you're fighting off the negative interpretation because that's the school that you're from then because you hear this all the time some other politicians are always saying i don't I like i feel like i'm demeaning the office by constantly going on am radio and constantly going on q a and all this kind of stuff and then you have your guys's uh side of the argument which is no just have the argument constantly constantly enjoy be pushing the it. debate enjoy the debate don't run from the debate but relish it. I'm just trying to think of other debates that you're having at the moment. I think that you're like quite verbal on Assange, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, why why did you take up that course? Well, I think it is, I think it was a test of whether we could have an argument with our ally and uh -huh. for that reason we should be asserting ourselves and this should take about three minutes of the President's time. All he's got to say is, okay, you Aussies, you want it, your good allies will do it for you. Mm. 
And when, he, when he's tackled by critics in Congress, all he's got to say is, yeah, yeah, I hear you fellas, but those Aussies asked me to do it. They're hopping mad. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yes, yes, yes. And yet uh, it didn't happen. No, no. Yeah. And that suggests again that our, our sovereignty is, has shrunk. I don't think Australia's international personality should be, oh, the, the most rusted on ally of the United States. In all politics may be local, but our friendship is permanent. Absolutely. This means Australia's got to have some reservations and some self-respect and some dignity uh -huh. in how we interpret the alliance relationship. Uh -huh. So what would you ideally want the relationship to be then? Give yeah, me a snapshot of that. When where America respects us more, because they never know when we're going to say, well, listen, we're not going that far. We're not going to say that. Um, or war with China over Taiwan. That's a hypothetical possibility. We ought to adhere to the old policy, Kissinger's words, that kept the peace in the Taiwan Strait, enabled the Taiwanese to have their own character, but used language that said, we acknowledge the Chinese claim that Taiwan's part of China. Not hard, not hard. Say it after me and put it up on a blackboard. <laughs> Stick to the formula. It kept the peace for 70 years. Why stray from it? America can't allow itself to become motivated by this twitching anxiety that they're about to lose primacy. Mm. And they've got to have Australia as a vast military encampment from which they fight to maintain their primacy in Asia, because that's the position we're now in. Do you see any optimistic little rays of hope in this, or is it going in the wrong direction? I, I want to say that both sides, China and the United States, would understand deeply it is not in their interest to have a war, and there's a terrible danger of such a war degenerating into a nuclear exchange. So there should be wisdom on both sides. Occasionally you get a general say, well, I think there'll be war in 2027. What gives me some comfort is that people have been saying this for some years now. But Australia, what Australia should be doing is talking up the possibility of an understanding between America and China, urging both sides to cool the rhetoric, to pull back, to have guardrails and off-ramps before some disagreement or some misunderstanding, some miscalculation triggers a conflict. Yes, well, it does make me pine back <coughs> for the good old days of when you were foreign minister and also to Kevin Rudd's credit as well. Like, both of you guys really seem to be pushing that as being the role of Australia. Yeah, and the, the reason I applauded his appointment as our ambassador to Washington is that he understands Chinese-American diplomacy. And in the politest, most diplomatic way, he's capable of saying to Americans, conflict is not inevitable. There are red lines that have kept the peace. Why don't we retreat to them? Well, wow, what a much more uplifting and ambitious role you envision Australia to have. I think it's I, not bad. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that, peacekeeper. that is peacekeeper. Yeah, yeah, that's right. If, if people around the world say, well, when I think of Australia, um, what do I come up with? Australia, a responsible, creative middle power that talks about avoiding war, a calamitous war between the US and China. It's not a bad vision. Not a bad vision of Australia's personality in the world. Well, if I could just ask you as like a final question then, any words of wisdom for Chris Mint? He is doing so well, I wouldn't venture. He's avoiding a lot of the stuff up saying I made in my first term. So no words of wisdom for Chris Mintz. No, He's doing I, a better job than you, that's yes, it. Yes, that's <laughs> it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say it. I'm very happy to, and I think, I think his communication skills are absolutely remarkable. And he proves you don't have to have been a journalist. What impresses me is that he knows just the bare minimum that he should say, and he ends at that point. And that shows mm. real skill. Editing mm. yourself shows real skill. Mm. Maybe mm. I'd better practice it now. This has been a very no, good interview, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a, a lot. Great honour.